Hello. So uh, I said this in the first service, and I still think it's so true. It's, it's a little different when you put the Britney Spears microphone on. <laughs> and I didn't share this, but when I was in high school, as tall, gangly, and pale as I am, I was on the hip-hop dance team. Oh. But I won't share. <laughs> So glad to have you with us. Uh, to everybody online, great to see you too. Uh, today we will continue our series reset uh, in the book of John. Uh, today we'll be in John chapter 4 to start uh, looking at statements we find in his gospel concerning the person of Jesus and how that affects our lives nowadays. So if you do have a Bible uh, or if you have your smart device with the Bible app on it, or if you need a paper Bible, we do have copies at our information counter, so feel free to grab one of those. We will be in John 4. So a little poll for you, the audience, and if you're online, you can weigh in. I'll look at it later and see how that turned out. Uh, earlier this week, while I was rehearsing, I guess that's the best term I can use, there was a confusing thing about my sermon for my wife. Now, mind you, she's 26, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying there might be things I know that she doesn't know because I'm old. Um, 33, the hair's gone, no. Um, but uh, I then took that poll to the general audience in the first service and uh, no one had the answer as to what I was trying to convey. So if you were here during the first service as a volunteer, please don't shout it out. I just want to see if anybody in the room's got it and say it loud and proud. When I say I enjoy American standards, what am I talking about? Music. Whoa, right off the front row. Good job, Laura. <laughs> music. Imagine that, the worship guy and music. Uh, the answers I did get, uh, and they weren't bad, they, they just weren't right, were the, just the standard of living in the United States of America. Not bad philosophically. It's like that might be something I enjoy, and I do. Uh, the other one, a little more fun, toilet seats. American standard. Yeah, there you go. That's where Maryland's head was, apparently. So, anywho, I really do enjoy American standards. Jazzy songs, old jazzy songs. Thank Frank Sinatra. Um, there's just something about that gentle swing and that croony voice. Just puts me in that place when I'm studying, reading a book, sitting at the house with a hot cup of coffee. It's going to be a jazz playlist I'm listening to. So personal favorite, a song that I'm sure a lot of you have heard before. Uh, it was popularized by Frank Sinatra during the NASA Apollo missions, Fly Me to the Moon. So you probably thought you'd get away without hearing me sing today. <laughs> But sorry, that's not the case. I got a little, little play along. So fill in some blanks for me as I sing this. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. Very good. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter. Very good. Let's jump forward a little bit. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. Worship and adore. Okay, I love this song. I love the sound. I love how it's sung. But that line always gives me pause. You see, as much as I love my wife, I could never sing this song to her. At least not that line. Because I would be putting her in a position that she doesn't belong Let's take a look at that core verse for today, John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. My wife, Michaela, is not and should not be the object of my worship. I can love her deeply. I can serve her devotedly. But she will never deserve my true worship. That's worship due unto God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for this moment and this week that we're blessed with to be together, to sing these songs about who you are, 
to gather around your table remembering how loved we are through Jesus. Lord, that we have your word with us daily to guide us, to encourage us, and ultimately to teach us who you truly are, that we might worship you in spirit and truth. May we be reminded always of those things as we live each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship, since the early days of the church, has been a hot topic. From Paul's writing to the churches of the New Testament, which make up the majority of the New Testament, to Martin Luther's 95 theses that he pounded into the church doors at Wittenberg, to the countless journal and magazine articles that are written to this day, that topic of worship, of how to do it, how not to do it, has been constantly hashed out. Here in John 4, Jesus is speaking with a Samaritan woman. Historically, the Samaritans worshipped at Mount Gerizim. And the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem at the temple. Jesus, in this conversation, is revealing to the Samaritan woman that worship is not going to be dictated by a place. It will be dictated by the heart of the worshiper. Since the establishment of the tabernacle, which happened all the way back in the Exodus, God's active presence was connected to a physical place. So that was the tabernacle or the temple. But now, because of Christ, we don't need a holy site to access God. It is understood that the use of spirit and truth refers to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus Christ, the truth. Mark Moore states it this way. The strikingly new nature of Christian worship honors the Father as experienced through Jesus by the indwelling of the Spirit. Our worship must be by the power of salvation in Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Apart from them, our worship is not complete. We know that true worship only happens because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like, or taste like? Today, I want us to consider a new posture. The Greek term for worship in this passage is Anyone? It's proskuneo. So before we get to what that word means and how we use it, I'm going to do a quick lesson on ancient Greek pronunciation. Recently, very recently, a certain lead minister and I have quibbled over the pronunciation of a certain word. Lagos. I will concede that there is a modern biblical worship software that uses the pronunciation logos. That's all well and good. But if we're reading ancient Greek, we should read it like the ancient Greeks, right? I mean, when you're in English class in high school, maybe you had to read some ancient literature, Beowulf, Chaucer. Middle English does not sound like modern English, does it? So let's talk about o vows. Our first, the O that's used in Lagos is Omicron. O micron, little O. Short O, so if you're a reading teacher, something like that, short O sounds. We all know them, hop, stop, mop, short O. If we want a long O sound, we'll go with omega. Omega, big, big O. Long O sounds like rows, toes, foes. So, I may be a right fighter. I'm not going to deny that, what Chris said. But when it comes to ancient languages, I'm going to listen to the experts on how to say the words. And if you need further proof concerning pronunciation, here he is, stand on the back, get ready, he's going to say something. Listen closely the next time Chris is reading an Old Testament passage with a list of names or places. It's logos. <laughs> Joking aside, joking aside, proskuneo, 
our big word there is the combination of two words that simply means to kiss toward. This term refers to an act of reverence towards a sovereign. So imagine the king, a ruler, or the president's coming to town. All the subjects and people are bowing and giving honor to that ruler. Maybe today a new posture for us is the posture of reverence. This is what our true worship should look like, a kissing towards, a bowing down, a reverential fear of who God is. I'm concerned that some of the time, a lot of the time, our worship is solely focused on love and adoration. Those are good things. They are completely good things. And they should be a part of our worship. But without recognizing how awesome, how mighty, how holy, how sovereign, powerful, and all-consuming God is, I don't believe our worship is fully true. Let's look at Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. His lightnings lit up the world. The earth saw and trembled. The mountains mounted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the peoples have seen his glory. Our God is not a God to be trifled with. His holiness is so great that when we see people experience him in the scriptures, they fall down in worship. They recognize his authority and respond in reverence far more often than they stand and or lift their hands. Let's look at what worship's gonna look like in heaven. Revelation chapter four. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. If you're unfamiliar with Catholic Mass, their worship experience, there is a lot of physical posturing. They stand, they sit, they kneel, wash, lather, rinse, repeat. It's a lot of motion. And though this behavior may seem strange, possibly rote, or even contrived to some of us, I believe there's something to be said about physically changing our posture before God. Though it may not be necessary to understand or grasp who he is, it does physically connect our bodies with our hearts and minds. This isn't a perfect analogy, but go with me. Look to your left or right. Maybe you see somebody you love. I hope you see somebody you love. Now, imagine that the only way you express your love to that person is by your words. Just words. No hugs, no kisses, no acts of service, ones that come to mind, loading, unloading the dishwasher, changing the baby, that's become very relevant. <laughs> no gifts, just words. Does that love feel wholehearted? You can answer. It may be true in your mind and heart, but without those deeper expressions, what is it worth? So maybe a reset to a posture of reverence is due for some of us. Maybe a second posture is that of service. Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You may have heard the term life verse before. It's a passage of scripture that an individual holds close in their minds or hearts all the time, kind of to direct, to direct their day or maybe encourage them. Personally, I don't have a life verse. I don't think they're necessary. All scripture is God breathed and therefore we can look at it all. If you do have one and it's very encouraging you, that's awesome. For me, there isn't one specific, but Romans 12 is a passage that does constantly resonate in my mind. It's the call to live a life of worship, a life fully devoted to God and what he would have us do, a sacrifice of self-interest for the purpose of his kingdom, a recognition and doing of his will. James 1, 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Worship isn't just singing a song. It's not just taking communion. It's not just bringing in an offering. It's not just saying a prayer. And it's not just reading the Bible. It's all of those things. And it's the follow through of moving from those moments of meditation to active moments of service and building his kingdom. So with all this social distancing and staying at home, there was a great possibility that our hashtag serve 2020 initiative was not going to be very great. However, as Aaron shared earlier, we've nearly met our goal of 2000 hours of service. We can clap about that. Late Christian Church, you haven't just sat back and kept Jesus for yourselves. You've taken him into our community. Keep up the good work. Before COVID-19, personally, I was blessed to volunteer at Carysbrook Elementary as a reading tutor. Sadly, I can't do that now. So I've kind of been in a place where I'm looking for that consistent place of service. I still do weekend projects, I still bring food for the food bank, those things. But I have not found that one spot where I can truly develop relationships within service to share Jesus. And maybe you're there too. But we can do this, right? All of us together, by each other's encouragement in Jesus, we can do this. And even if we don't have that one service opportunity right now, let's not look over the daily thing. It's the holding doors for people. It's the kindly greeting of strangers. Stopping to say hello and praying with the homeless person at the stoplight. Maybe preparing a meal for somebody who's recovering from a surgery or like me, bringing a newborn home. I got a lot of meals, they were awesome, thank you guys. Maybe it's picking up groceries for shut-ins or at-risk people. Or simple, taking back a shopping cart for someone. It doesn't have to be a fully organized effort. It can be as simple as seeing that small need and filling that small need. Just recognizing Jesus' love and service toward us and expressing that to his creation. Hebrews 10. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you say, see the day drawing near. As much as worship is and can be very personal, it does not happen in a vacuum. We're the body of Christ, here to do good deeds. So, let us encourage each other always as we patiently await Christ's return. 
As we reset to the new postures of reverence and service, we recognize God in all his glory and respond by serving his kingdom as true worshipers in the Holy Spirit by the saving power of the truth, Jesus Christ. If you're seeking to become a true worshiper, having not yet accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior and being immersed in baptism for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, don't let this moment pass. The baptistry's full, and there's a great group of people here ready to encourage you as you live that daily life of worship. We're gonna close singing the song, So Will I. This song is the whole gospel, from creation to Jesus to our lives today. Earlier I spoke about this action of bowing. Now I know everybody in the room may not be physically capable of taking a posture of bowing, but if you are, I invite you to join me as I bow for this last song. Maybe you don't know all the lyrics, that's okay. Let them be sung over you. Let the truth of who God is and what he's done rest in your heart and mind. Let it encourage you to go from this place to serve this world knowing how loved you are. John 4, 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth.